Hello and welcome to another episode of Katie the Science Lady. I'm Mrs. Jacobson and today we are talking about body system regulation, which we also call homeostasis. So let's learn together. All right, friends, let's talk about homeostasis. I'm going to jump around quite a bit today uh, because this is such a complex topic. We as humans are incredibly complicated and there's nothing really more complicated than the way that we regulate our bodies because we don't know that we're doing it. These are all things that happen without our knowledge. It's subconscious. Our body does these things for us and it can be really dangerous if our body isn't doing this properly. So I'm going to give you basically an introduction to these systems, um, but by no means is this comprehensive. So if you want more information about this, feel free to look up more videos about the endocrine system or about how we regulate all of our body systems. Let's go ahead and get started. The first thing we have to talk about is the endocrine system. It is one of my favorite body systems, probably because it is the most complicated, in my opinion. There are so many different things involved in the endocrine system, and they're so heavily entwined to every part of our life that I just find it kind of cool. The endocrine system consists of glands. So you've probably heard of the word gland before. You have lots of them in your body. Um, and the job of a gland is to produce and secrete, or kind of let go, of hormones. Hormones are chemical messengers of the body. You have probably heard the word hormone before because usually your mom or dad or some relative has said, your hormones are going crazy. You're a teenager. That happens a lot. We say it a lot. But what we're talking about when we say hormones, they're the chemical messengers your body makes naturally. It's not a problem. It's just part of growing up, honestly. One of the most important glands is the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is located in the brain and it acts like a monitoring system for your whole body, basically. And that should make sense to us. Our brain is involved with our thinking processes and also all of our subconscious processes like our temperature regulation um, and a bunch of other different things. It is a monitoring system. So its job is to alert the pituitary gland, which then can talk to all of our other glands. So it's kind of like a chain reaction process here. If something is wrong, the hypothalamus gets that message first and then sends out information to the other glands that can fix the problem. The pituitary gland, it's in charge of so many different things. It releases hormones that control our hunger, thirst, our sex hormones, um, our development, our emotions, our body temperature, stress levels, almost everything you can think of that you don't actively think and then move your body, the pituitary gland is going to have a chain reaction and influence that. Here's our, um, we've got our different glands in the brain here. They are fairly small. So when you think about these things, glands are not giant. They're not really big structures. Um, they're fairly small. And if they are not producing the correct amount of hormones, or if they're not working at all, it can have disastrous effects for your body. Um, we need our hormones and we need them to be in the proper amounts for our reaction to these hormones to be correct. Okay. So again, we have the hypothalamus here. I wanted to just show you kind of a, a general picture of it. Um, again, this is located in the brain. So that's what you just saw on that last slide. Now, when we look at it, its job is to communicate with all these different glands here. We have the ovaries and the testes. You may not be able to see this, but it also releases growth hormone um, to affect our bones and our muscles to allow us to grow. It affects um, things like prolactin, which would be producing milk for babies. Um, it affects our adrenal glands, which are located on top of our kidneys. Um, it affects our thyroid, which is a gland found kind of in your throat. And that has many effects on your body. And then it also does smaller things like uh, release ADH, which is called antidiuretic hormone, which basically tells your body to absorb more water or release more water. So there are just a number of things that your endocrine system will do, but if it deals with a hormone, it is your endocrine system at work. That is the biggest thing that I can tell you, the kind of the key. If you see the word hormone, you have to think endocrine system. They are always, always, always together. 
we need to talk about a couple of other systems as well that are involved in homeostasis. Homeostasis is the basically the state of having a stable internal environment. Now, this is really important. We want to keep an, an environment that's constant for our body because our body really doesn't like to be out of whack. You'll know this because if you've ever had a fever, that's only a difference of between two and three, maybe four degrees Fahrenheit from normal to in the hospital fever. Our body does not like big changes <laughs> and things like this. It needs to keep everything constant so that it can function its best. The integumentary system is one of the systems that helps us maintain this stable internal environment. It includes our skin, hair, nails, and then the sweat and oil glands in our skin. In our skin. It helps us regulate our body temperature, helps us produce sweat. Um, sweat's job is to cool you off, even though sometimes it doesn't seem like it. When wind blows on the sweat on your skin, it does have a cooling effect. And you've probably felt this if you've ever worked out and sweat a lot and then walked outside and it's been cold, it feels really extra cold. Um, so sweat's job is to cool you off. You can see that we have many things involved in our skin. We have sweat pores, we have sweat glands, we also have what are called sebaceous glands. Those are oil producing glands. And then we have these little muscles here called erector pili muscles. They're attached to every single hair you have and those little muscles are what make your hair stand up. Whether you're afraid of something, whether you're surprised, you get the chills, um, or if you're cold, those muscles contract and actually they're trying to warm you back up. So if those little muscles are contracting and you get goosebumps, um, that's trying to warm you up. So shivering helps warm you up and goosebumps are actually your body's attempt to warm you up as well because it's trying to regulate your body temperature and get you back to homeostasis. We can't talk about homeostasis without talking about feedback mechanisms. Again, this is going to be a very brief introduction to homeostasis and feedback mechanisms. There are many other videos you can watch if you want a more in-depth look, but I'm just kind of going to give you an introduction here, dip your toe in a little bit. Most body processes follow negative feedback. Now that sounds bad. Negative feedback sounds like a bad thing, but it's not. It's really, really important, and I'll explain why. When we have negative feedback processes, the stimulus, or what starts the process, and the outcome, or the end result of the process, are opposites, which bring the body back in balance. I think of it like a teeter-totter. If we start in the middle, and if this one side of the teeter-totter goes down, this side goes up. To get back to normal, this side must go down and bring this side back up. So they have to be in opposition so that we come back in balance. Here's an actual example. Let's say it is 105 outside. I used to live in Arizona. It could get up to 115 and it was really hot. If your body gets too hot and your internal temperature rises, you start sweating. And the sweat's job is to cool you off. So the stimulus was high heat, and then your body's response was to bring your temperature back down. So they are in opposition to each other. That's what we mean by negative feedback. This happens with uh, many other things in your body. Almost everything else in your body is negative feedback. For example, blood sugar. If you eat a cookie and your blood sugar gets really, really high, you need to have something to bring that sugar into your cells. So your body produces insulin, a hormone, which brings your blood sugar back to normal by putting that sugar in your cells and not in your bloodstream. Again, when we're too hot, we sweat and body temperature decreases. This is the feedback loop for body temperature. I'm gonna walk through it once just to show you the idea of a feedback loop. So in our brain, we will signal, uh oh, it's too hot. So our skin then releases sweat. Heat is released from the body by us sweating. Our blood vessels also dilate. That releases heat too, but sweating is one that we can visually see. When we sweat, our blood temperature, oh, sorry, our blood temperature decreases, which tells our brain we're good to go. Similarly, if we get too cold, our skin is going to not sweat. We are going to have those erector pili muscles contracting to create heat. We'll shiver to create heat and our blood vessels constrict to try and save that heat. That increases our blood temperature and brings it back to normal. 
the common factor we have here, everything tries to go back to normal in negative feedback. And some of you might be thinking, okay, you're saying negative feedback. Is there positive feedback? There is. We're not going to focus on it in this video because positive feedback in involves building on a stimulus. So for example, contractions in labor. Once you have one contraction, it causes a response to have another contraction and another and another and another. So the stimulus and the outcome for positive feedback is the same. The basic one we wanna talk about today is negative feedback because you may need to see a feedback loop at some point and understand it. One of the last things we need to talk about today is the respiratory system. And it includes our lungs, our trachea, and our bronchi. And the reason we're talking about the respiratory system is because it is regulating the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide that we have in our bloodstream. And the respiratory system is so important because we need to regulate this amount. If we don't have enough oxygen coming into our body's cells, they are not going to function properly. And likewise, if we can't get rid of our carbon dioxide, we kind of poison ourselves with carbon dioxide. So we need to make sure this exchange is happening appropriately. In this picture here, we have an alveoli, which I never think I'm saying correctly. It sounds like ravioli to me, but it's a small area in your lungs, a very small section where this gas exchange actually happens. And as part of the respiratory system, that's occurring in the lungs. So you bring in oxygen and air through your nose and mouth. It travels through your trachea, into your bronchi, into your lungs. And that's where you're going to exchange that oxygen and carbon dioxide. The last system we're going to talk about today is the excretory system. And the excretory system is responsible for the movement, removal of liquid waste from the body. A lot of people think that it's responsible for um, solid waste, but it's not. Um, solid waste removal is a job for the digestive system. The excretory system can also be called the urinary system, but I prefer to call it excretory because it involves more than just urine. It involves um, our waste gases as well. So again, not waste in the digestive system here. It includes our urinary tract, which is our kidneys, our bladder, our urethra, and it allows us to remove waste products from our bloodstream. So it's kind of weird to think about but when we remove liquid waste from the body, when we urinate, we are actually filtering all the waste products from our blood. So our kidneys take blood through them, remove all the byproducts, and just recycle water and other good things back into our bloodstream. The excretory system also includes our skin because we sweat out some of these extra things and our lungs because we get rid of carbon dioxide. So it's just really important to think of excretory as our waste removal system for liquid and gas. Digestive system gets rid of our solid waste for us. It's just that end byproduct. But the excretory system, again, sometimes called the urinary system, is removing our liquid waste and our gas waste as carbon dioxide. Here's a picture of your urinary system or your excretory system. You have your kidneys here you can see that we have two very large blood vessels in the vena cava and the aorta here that are connected to the kidneys. So blood flow goes through these big blood vessels into the kidneys where it's pressed through and filtered into the ureters. The ureters are those yellow tubes on the diagram. They enter into the bladder, which we've all heard of a bladder before. It gets full and then you urinate outward. So that is the whole point of our excretory system is to get waste to leave the body. We know that if you have waste inside the body and it builds up over time, you can get really, really sick. So you need the excretory system to keep that homeostasis because all of those waste products need to leave your system. All right, that was a lot of information about homeostasis. Let's get back to the star of the show, the endocrine system. The endocrine system is made up of different glands that produce chemical messengers called hormones. And these hormones circulate through the bloodstream in order to get to different organs, cells, and other affected areas. Homeostasis is an incredibly important word in science and especially in biology. Homeostasis is the idea of maintaining a stable internal environment, whether that be in your cells, organs, or body as a whole. I like to think of this kind of like a teeter-totter. If you tip too far in one direction, your body is going to kind of try and re-regulate yourself and 
even you back out so that you're back to that normal stable condition. The body likes to correct itself, whether it's body temperature, um, blood sugar, blood calcium levels, um, water balance, anything like that is going to be regulated by homeostasis. And that's it for us today. Please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. And as always, I hope you had fun. I hope you learned something and I'll see you later.